Okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Andrew Schrock, who's a um, post, uh, communication postdoctoral fellow in Organization, Communication and Technology at Chapman University. Uh, generically, his research, he says, is about how people collaborate, design, and use communication technologies, data, and mobile media to improve political engagement, organization, and community life. Um, received a BA in computer science and fine art from Brandeis, then moved on to digital media at the University of Central Florida, and his thesis um, examined habitual use of um, um, social network sites among youth groups. Um, he is the uh, co-editor of the volume Making Our World, The Hacker and Making Movements in Context, um, and he's also the publisher of this book, Civic Tech, um, which is the public-facing um, uh, version of his work. He's about he's currently putting together an arcane version of the work for the academic uh, the academic process. Um, I think you can see the title "Easy Diseases." I can read it out to you. So, without further ado, let's welcome Andrew. Thank you. so much for that kind introduction. Um, and yes, yeah, so this this is the, I brought a couple copies with me um, if you'd like to pick one up. Um, and then if I run out of copies, I can always send you one. And then I have some freebies like stickers and, and some fun stuff. Oh, just a second. <laughs> Taking my notes. <laughs> Unless that's part of the, the uh, this rigorous examination. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is mostly how you can fly. <laughs> 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 um, okay. <clears throat> yeah. So there, there's a lot of ways to sort of enter my work. This is kind of one of them, and this is really kind of, I'm at this moment where, um, as was mentioned, I finished this first book project, which is kind of a public facing book. Um, and it's really one that brought together my interests in civic engagement, technology design, um, and hacker culture. Um, and it's really oriented for, you know, just a, a popular audience. It's not an academic book. Um, yeah, the next one I'll go, I'll go through and make you know, every um, paragraph into a page and switch out the accessible language with <laughs> complex words and then call it a day. Um, no, but really, the next book is really more explicitly about the relationship between organization and um, communication in the context of public sector organizations working on technology. And I'll talk about kind of what some of those organizations or organizational forms are um, throughout my presentation. Um, so I, I thought I'd start kind of by narrating this presentation with um, kind of what I learned from working on this book. Um, and this is, this is sort of the, the book, Making Technology Work for People. Um, and I called it that to really draw attention to um, you know, the, the kind of both the cultural formations behind it and then also the um, kind of the collectivity behind it as well. Um, so kind of, I have a couple sort of positions that I like to kind of start off with to sort of start to set the ground for uh, how I see things happening in this world. Um, so I usually tell people that I research um, uh, public sector uh, organizations that look at design and technology design, and I can see that they sit there thinking kind of much as you are, about what exactly I could be referring to. Um, and I think as I went through this exercise over and over again, um, I realized that there's not really a collective understanding of what exactly these organizations are. You know, so people would say, well, clearly not Google, not Facebook, uh, not Twitter. Well, what, what is he talking about? Um, and so, you know, I, I got really intrigued by this um, idea of, um, you know, not just sort of public participation in design, but also public ownership of uh, technology, and really integrating technology with broader reforms. So not just sort of, um, you know, having technology um, thrown out of a plane and parachute down into some uh, community situation with the hope that it will have some desired effect. Um, 
but really trying to think about, well, what are the um, you know, institutional um, questions? What, how does local government think about technology? How can we get inside local government? What about this bridge between community and local government that I think we'd all like to have exist a little bit more than it kind of functionally does in everyday life? Um, and really, I think this echoes a lot of scholars calling for more communication around technological issues. So everyone from sort of um, technology, technological philosophers, I would say, like Langdon Winner, um, scholars of material participation, like Mark Mars, and policy writers like Beth Novak, are all sort of saying, well, we need to find um, some way to involve uh, the public in a more um, meaningful way in technology design, such that it changes um, their life circumstances. Um, Simultaneously, um, I think we're also at a moment where um, technology companies fetishize civic institutions. So I'm sort of picking up here a bit. Um, there's this great line that Fred Turner um, has about it. when he talks about the new communalists. He talks about how they're attracted to ideas of sociality, much like a magpie. And he was sort of talking about how a lot of people in technology industries came from a longer kind of um, social and cultural movement um, that really attuned them to be interested in questions of um, sociality. Um, I think it's very much like this, but in the civic realm. So these pictures um, are intentionally sort of um, chosen to show sort of the spectacle of uh, that I think technology companies are getting very good at. Um, spectacle is sort of the theme of one of my chapters that I don't talk much about today. Um, but is kind of central to the next book. Um, so for instance, we have Apple's um, notion of um, town squares, which are basically uh, stores. Um, and then we have, of course, uh, maybe hard to see, but it's a fireside chat. You know, it's kind of the FDR style, um, kind of um, very um, personal, very um, intimate sort of gathering around an eye. Um, it sounds good. It's with um, Tim Cook and talking about kind of how Apple um, envisions um, its own participation in the civic realm. Um, and I'm told um, Sophia Noble was here lately. Um, and, right? Yeah. So um, one of the things that she said at uh, the last talk I saw of hers at USC was that kind of one of the mistakes we make about Google is we think Google should operate under the same sort of value system as something like a library. And uh, it really just does not. And we're sort of perpetually sort of surprised about this. And I think, um, you know, something I, I noted, for instance, when Mark Zuckerberg went to Washington, um, you know, I was like, why, why do we think, it seems like we think Mark's, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook is some sort of civic institution when it's really not. And I think that one of the problems is that conceptually we're sort of struggling to find um, alternatives that are, I think, more um, ethical, that do take into account uh, local community needs. Um, so, you know, they draw on the vocabulary of civic institutions when it's convenient. Um, you know, but then sort of the contrast to this is that they're really, you know, or in my opinion, not very many democratic institutions for technology design. You don't really have public ownership, and you really have little participation um, in uh, technological issues. This sort of there's a long kind of um, line of thinking about why this might be. Um, there have always been, by the way, I think um, this point gets missed. People have always sort of known that technology um, is somewhat problematic on its own, and they try to intervene in its uh, design. There are long histories, for instance, of um, organizations like um, Radical, Radical Statistics in the UK, um, which it really organizes around data issues and has since the 1970s. Um, and they've been around for 45 years, but their membership has never really gone over about 500 people in any given year. So there's always been kind of, I think, a core group of people that are really concerned about this stuff. Um, but it's never really, it may never be kind of a mainstream uh, kind of question like we sort of maybe want it to be. Um, and my second position is that people are organizing a lot around technology design. So with my book, Civic Tech, it's called Civic Tech because um, that's the name that 
kind of practitioners in the field gave to their work. Uh, so that's a term that I saw that I wanted to kind of um, describe and um, kind of show the value of, even if kind of trying to guide people towards some of their better ideas and away from some of the more problematic ones. So I spent a lot of time going to civic hackathons, um, talking to people in different organizations, um, you know, going to co-working spaces where these things were um, happening. I worked for the city of Los Angeles for the better part of a year. Um, so kind of in these spaces and going across these institutional barriers, um, I really didn't see a lot of what uh, Morozov calls uh, solutionism. And I didn't really see a lot of like labor style organizing. Um, and I didn't really see a lot of, a whole lot of utopian and, and dystopian rhetoric. Um, but what I did see was a lot of organizational experiments, you know, to sort of riff on Chris Kelty's notion of recursive publics. This is maybe sort of uh, kind of recursive civics, right? Where people are experimenting with different ways of um, uh, kind of uh, creating this relationship between technology um, and improved civic behavior and outcomes. Um, but it's a very sort of wild and woolly space. There's a lot of disagreement. There's a lot of um, even conflicts. Um, so people in this space um, are everyone from, you know, they hold sort of political positions everywhere from sort of like, um, you know, socialists to, um, you know, more, uh, you know, uh, liberal democratic to, uh, for instance, one of the examples I give is that um, Code for Maine was founded, founded by an acolyte of the um, prominent anarchist scholar uh, Murray Bookchin. So, you know, there, I think there's a lot more texture and a lot more um, variety in this world than people um, kind of gave it credit for. Um, and I saw not really a robust public sphere and sort of you know, the language of um, communication scholarship, um, but really sort of a set of kind of fractured nonprofits and government partners pursuing a range of approaches and interests. Um, and it's not all good, of course. In fact, it's sort of right with, um, can bring on kind of paternalist approaches. Um, it can be too top down. Um, there's power at play all around. These are things I'm going to talk about. Um, so for me, sort of when, coming out of the book and coming into the next book, um, I started to sort of pay attention to the, you know, what I'd say is a long tradition of organizational communication research, and then also sort of a long tradition in America of sort of organizing more formally. Um, so for me, sort of where the action is, is, you know, with organizing and with people coming together in sometimes new and unfamiliar ways. Um, so sort of my third position is that, um, and sort of why I'm taking this position may take sort of the whole of the presentation to sort of understand. Um, but I think in these organizational situations, technology is fundamentally ambiguous. So, you know, as much as we might, um, you know, point to something like a cell phone and say, well, this is technology, it's really somewhat of an illusion, because technology is sort of a bundling of mythologies, practices, industries. Um, so, um, you know, I think, um, and then sort of, I started to think about this, I read this sort of classic piece, reread this classic piece by Eric Eisenberg called Strategic Ambiguity. Um, and Strategic Ambiguity, he was talking about how um, organizationally, and we can also think kind of politically, it's rarely a wise move to be um, blunt on exactly, for instance, what your, um, you know, uh, what you think is the correct policy move. In fact, it pays to be somewhat ambiguous because you're building bridges between different um, participants in this world. So they can all sort of look at you and say, well, clearly I see something of myself in this idea that's being floated. Um, you know, and from there I started to think about feminist technology scholar Anne Valsalo's contention that uh, technology can't necessarily be bottled up, as I said. Um, and in these kind of design situations, in particular, I think um, technology a lot of the time just simply does not yet exist. And in a lot of these organizational settings, it's actually preferable for these organizations to not have the technology exist. I know this sounds somewhat counterintuitive, like when we talk about 
technology design in these organizations, but then also moments where um, it's actually not desirable to have like too much technology under production. Um, so, you know, I thought I'd start with this David Nye quote too, which comes from his, one of his late 90s books, um, to sort of talk about, you know, how I think our civic vocabularies have always been kind of merged and muddled up with our um, technological ones. Um, and in many ways, I think um, talking about technology lets us talk about a world where circumstances are different. Um, in many ways, it acts as sort of a civic um, lubricant of sorts. So, for instance, if you're trying to get government officials around a table, um, it's oftentimes much easier to get them around the table to talk about technology um, because it seems like something um, that or at least appears to be somewhat value neutral. It appears to be something that they might roll into other things that they're interested in. And because it's something that sometimes flies below the radar um, of a lot of things that people vote on. So um, just to sort of sum up, um, so I think kind of communication in these organizations and organizational forms I'm going to talk about is essential to mobilize community partners um, and drive participation. I don't think they're necessarily serving as democratic institutions, but I think they're kind of constructing what we might call proto-institutions, or what Brian McKinnerty calls conventions of collaboration. Um, so these are emergent forms of collaboration that can fill in or take the place of actual democratic institutions. Um, so I'm a communication scholar. This may be a slightly different um, framework than some of the ones you're used to. Um, but I think I'm really attracted to a perspective that's just called Communication Constitutes Organizations, or CCO. So this comes out of a lot of organizational communication literature, um, you know, and there's sort of these perpetual debates about, you know, how does organizing happen? Does it happen through the materiality of technology? Does it happen through what happens in specific um, situations or spaces? Um, and McPhee and Zell sort of um, concluded that you know what's helpful to kind of building theory and what's helping to talk about organizing um, is to think about how communication actually um, creates the organization, right? So in organizing, we're essentially talking about communication. Um, as a communication scholar, this is helpful for me because what I really want to do, of course, as I mentioned, is to sort of go into different organizational settings look at what's being said, presented, um, and then kind of drawing conclusions from that. Um, so, it, you know, um, I think in these different flows, um, of course, sort of different organizing or uh, organizational forms um, rely on different sort of flows a little bit more. So, for instance, um, in terms of um, uh, Code for America, which is one of the organizations I'm going to be talking about um, that counts around 40,000 members, which is their, it's probably a high statistic, but it's their official one. Um, you know, they're particularly kind of concerned with institutional positioning and membership negotiation, because they're always sort of in this position where they want to bring people more into um, their world and participate, and then also negotiate relationships um, within government. Um, for other types of organizational forms um, we're going to be talking about, like one is innovation teams, which exist kind of mainly inside of government. Um, this is really um, less of the issue. Um, it really becomes more about kind of activity coordination. Um, and flows involve a variety of media interactions around kind of a similar um, topic. So sort of the larger project I'm looking at here is how forms of communication and different types of organizing um, bring about different, you know, different types of communication bring about different types of organizing. Um, but just to be clear, I'm not saying, I'm not making a medium specificity argument. So for instance, you can tell stories in a variety of different ways. You can tell stories through the news. You can tell stories on YouTube. You can tell stories uh, in person. Um, similarly, um, you can, uh, the other sort of form of um, communication I'm going to talk about with respect to iTeams relates to talk. Um, 
So you can talk in person, um, but although Irvin Goffman didn't really talk too much about mediated communication, we can certainly talk online. Um, you know, of course, the best example I can think of is our president, uh, who feels very free to speak his mind online. Um, and we can think, too, about sort of the um, after effects um, to government itself as an entity um, because of that. Um, we really do, I think we've sort of gone through this moment, too, where um, the idea of sort of increased openness and transparency for a very long time seemed palatable. There's sort of waves that come and go of interest in this stuff. Um, you know, but I do think there are times where you do need to develop trust with collaborators inside government to understand that um, you do have uh, coalitions to do things like pass policy. Um, so on that note, I'd like to jump into talking about storytelling and code for America. So Code for America has been around for um, almost 10 years. Um, you're really, when I, was in, when I was writing my book, um, actually after I wrote my book, I looked back on the manuscript and I said, man, there's a lot of Code for America in this book. Um, and it sort of was a little disturbing to me for a moment because I didn't really write a book about Code for America, but they're just so present in the space that nearly everyone you talk to will have some sort of connection to them. Um, they've been in operation since 2009, um, and they really emerged in San Francisco. And I think that's not coincidental considering the city has such a long tradition uh, in both kind of two things. One is the tech industries, and then the other is activism. And I think the way these things kind of came together is that they're trying to do kind of administrative reforms um, inside of government and bridging that with participation outside of government. And this type of brokering relationship, I think, um, can be very powerful, um, but it's also, as I mentioned, kind of somewhat, somewhat difficult. Um, so one, one way to think about, um, one way to sort of enter this world of, of Code for America is to kind of go to the Brigade Summit which was towards the end of last year. And this is where a lot of the brigade members, um, I actually forgot to mention, um, brigades are sort of um, grassroots organizations that Code for America fosters. So say you're a small group of techies, um, that's sort of my analytical term too. So, you know, much as Bella Coleman talks about hackers, um, or Chris Kelty talks about geeks, I talk about techies, which are um, may or may not be sort of super technically inclined, some of them don't know how to code. Um, it's really kind of a wide variety of people. But say you have a group of techies kind of in your local um, community, um, and you're rallying them together to um, work on software and build relationships with local government. Um, code for America will help that in a variety of ways, um, some of which are kind of financial, some of which are um, they'll help you kind of build your organization under there. So for instance, you don't have to actually have a nonprofit status. Um, this ends up being kind of a big deal because once you're a nonprofit, you have to pay taxes. I don't know how many, uh, I've also done work looking at hacker and maker spaces. I don't know how many hacker and maker spaces have closed down simply because someone forgot to pay the taxes and that was the end of that. Um, so this ends up being um, a pretty big deal for them. Uh, fellowships are kind of a more formal type of placement where they place teams typically of free uh, techies inside local government to work on um, particular problems. So this was a gathering of kind of like all of the brigades at once. Um, and there's this particularly interesting moment, I think, um, kind of in the presentation on, I think, the second day, um, where the speaker kind of looked at everyone in the crowd and said, OK, everyone here who works for the government stand up. A room of about 150 people, 10 people stood up. Um, you know, and then they got a little round of applause. And it was, well, if you've ever worked for the government, stand up. It was about, I don't know, 15 more people, not a whole lot, stood up and got a round of applause. And then, um, you know, then the, the third move was, well, if you want to work for the government, stand up. You know, and then everyone stood up and gave themselves a round of applause. After that, we went to, um, this was in Philadelphia. 
Uh, Philadelphia Town Hall is sort of um, an open public space. In fact, it has a subway kind of inside of City Hall. I don't know how this got built. There's probably an interesting story there. Um, but you know, you can just sort of walk there. Um, and this is I'm in there. I don't know where. Um, somewhere. Uh, I have to get out my magnifying glass. But um, so we're sort of escorted into City Hall. We got sort of this. Um, you know, picture taken of the group. Um, but, you know, we, we weren't working in City Hall necessarily. This was sort of this aspirational thing that kind of um, rallying the troops around trying to forge relationships with government in their own communities. Um, so, kind of crucially, I, I'm not actually telling this story with scare quotes. Like, I think, like, we do need um, competent people. Uh, working for local government. Like, this isn't a crazy idea by any means. Uh, in fact, if you sort of look at sort of, I don't know, rampant corruption and just in the Southern California area, it's clear that this needs to be something that could exist. It needs to be a plausible kind of occupation. Um, I've taught classes, um, or guest lectured classes of like 120 students in the past of undergrads. And in some of them, I just say, how, how many of you would actually consider working for the government? And if I'm lucky, I'll get one or two hands out of 100 students. Um, so this was kind of a difficult bridge that um, they're trying to build. Um, so the central puzzle to me sort of became kind of how does Code for America drive participation and get this group of socialists, activists, and policy wonks to all kind of work together. Um, and I really came back to this idea of storytelling, um, partly because um, before I went to the brigade, I had a chat with one of the brigade leaders in uh, Long Beach, and I, you know, we, we're just hanging out. And I said, you know, what, what, what do you think Code for America wants from the brigades? And sort of without question, he said, oh, stories. They want the stories. And you know, that was sort of one of those moments that as a communication scholar, I was like, oh, aha. Uh -huh. You know, I, I've, this whole time I've sort of been paying attention to um, the technology and not enough attention to the stories and not a, enough attention to the people. Um, and so you know, the narrative paradigm of communication is really about how the world is a set of stories we choose from to give meaning to our lives. Um, and we sort of select from them based on coherence and fidelity. Um, so you know, th this is sort of how to help explain the fact that um, people believe somewhat wacky things. Oh, because it makes sense to them. It fits in their lives. It fits within their particular rationality. Um, but in the context of technology design, I think stories are really essential um, for a number of reasons. Uh, stories help ideas about technology travel across boundaries of organizations and cultures. Um, stories get money. You can tell stories if you're a nonprofit organization. Tell stories to your foundation partners uh, to get money. Um, you can tell stories that are understandable by the public. Not everybody cares about a new database. This is something that I think a lot of kind of techies learned early on when they were it was sort of a big wave of sort of open data. Um, I've written a bit about kind of that as well. Um, but I think at the end of the day, a lot of the time there was sort of this misunderstanding where people were, where a lot of techies were like, why aren't people more excited about this stuff? Well, um, they don't really have much reason to be. It doesn't seem to affect their daily lives. Um, and finally, I think stories are necessary to, as Jennifer Helen Mayer uh, suggests, uh, infuse technical work with moral meaning. Um, so Code for America, when it does this kind of um, appeal, when it tries to get people involved with two things that are kind of utterly boring, um, administrative reforms and technology. Most people don't want to know very much about either of those things. Um, you know, it, it's, it's going, this is what I think where, where sort of the motivation sort of comes from. Um, so when I started paying attention to Code for America around 2011, I saw sort of a model where it was sort of assumed that you would get technology from brigades and fellowships, and they were being brought to market through an accelerator um, or incubator. Um, so the idea was that I think kind of Code for America um, would get access to technology that they could either redeploy or um, 
bring to market in some way, shape, or form. The number of uh, technologies that's kind of came out of this wave is fairly small. I think Secret Fix is like one of the success stories. Um, but sort of after that, I saw something else happening. I saw them really changing the language that they use, and they started to adopt really the language of um, traditional nonprofit. So, um, for example, this is an email I got um, from Code for America towards the end of um, last year or the year before. Um, by choosing to donate, you're engaging in highly leveraged philanthropy, you know, with the amount of money you give corresponding to um, what will happen with that money. It's not that different from what you would see from Red Cross or Doctors Without Borders. Um, it's fairly kind of conventional language. Um, and then I saw them really moving from sort of stories of technological saviors to stories of social justice. Um, so kind of around 2009 when they first, first formed, it was very much about um, we're going to bring technology to government from the private sector to improve what it is they're doing. And I think, uh, I don't think that really um, had the oomph to kind of carry the day in any long-term way. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons why it didn't. Um, one of which is that sometimes technologies, you know, um, in, in IS you're familiar with this, were made for particular local situations, but um, when you kind of took them and gave them to a different set of users, um, it no longer had um, a functional utility for them. Um, so the kind of the um, intrinsically local nature of knowledge was a challenge. Um, the other thing that I think um, proved to be a challenge is that a lot of government officials had heard this one before um, of technology coming in, saving the day, solving all their problems. Um, it's, I think, a narrative that has been probably around for as long as technology has existed. Um, and I, I don't think it sort of led to many long-term gains. So kind of around you know, 2013, I started following people like Jacob Solomon, who um, was part of um, the Get Cal Fresh team, which really looked at um, how to reform the way that people receive food assistance. Uh, and he wrote a book called, or a, book, a blog post called People Not Data on Disdain and Empathy in Civic Tech where he sort of narrated this um, story of what it was like to actually um, apply for food stamps, or what we sort of call food stamps, government food assistance, which in California are called SNAP benefits, um, and then sort of the degrading things that you would have to go through to remain on uh, government food assistance. I think one of the more um, compelling images, at least for me, um, kind of in the story is um, going into one of these centers. They've since, of course, sort of changed them. But um, the, the sort of where you'd have to talk through, it's like a little bank teller window thing, kind of down low. Um, but most people you know, would have to either squat or, in one case, um, just sort of kneel to get uh, food assistance benefits. So I think he rightly sort of said, well, this is kind of degrading. We need to change this. We need to alter the way um, this is uh, provided to people. Um, and then you have people, I think, um, that are part of I don't know what wave we are at Code for America, but she's relatively recent, um, and I write about her a little bit, bit in the book, Jasmine Latimer. Um, and what she's working on is the public safety uh, initiative area in Code for America. Um, and she's really writing or um, telling the story of um, both sort of her um, product itself, which is this um, uh, called Clear My Record, which is about trying to clarify pathways to social knowledge inside of government um, such that people can get their records cleared if they're legally entitled to. So imagine you got arrested for something uh, when you were growing up, let's say a youthful indiscretion, um, and it's preventing you from getting a job. Now you're legally entitled to have that expunged. Uh, but the process for an expungement is actually kind of complicated, and it actually varies based on exactly where you live um, and the laws relating to your um, particular city and county. Um, so they started to sort of focus, this is also something familiar to nonprofits um, and foundations sort of focusing on particular initiative areas. Um, 
And I think what you see now is really something more like what's moving is not so much technology. Um, my theory is that Code for America um, didn't really need 100 partly working mobile applications um, that they then had to maintain and find a home for. That to them was not organizationally useful. What was organizationally useful for them uh, was uh, stories, as I've mentioned, and um, people to help them run their um, organization. Um, so what you really, I, what I really started to see happen, and um, the accelerator and incubator actually died, which I think is interesting. We don't sort of tell the story of what happens when the capitalist model totally fails. Um, I find that very interesting. Um, but what we see is a lot more of sort of money at a higher level going into Code for America, um, you know, from a mix of sort of foundations um, and private spark sponsorship. Um, to support kind of the community brigades, the fellows. Um, but the fellows are really reimagined to be sort of this glue between the brigades and the communities and local governments. And the fellowship program was recently revamped such that um, it's, they're giving essentially small grants to fellows to um, work on one specific project that connects kind of the labor in the brigades with kind of the need in local government. Um, and that's something that um, does a couple things. Most noteworthy, it fosters um, the healthiness of the brigades, and it gives the organization um, kind of stories that they can use to get more money. Um, so next I'd like to kind of talk about um, talk in innovation teams. Um, so innovation teams are kind of a form, as far as I can tell, they emerged in the 1960s in educational reform. Uh, they're adopted by the uh, corporate world, particularly management consultants, and then brought back into the public sector via Bloomberg Philanthropies. Um, so they funded a couple different waves <coughs> of um, innovation teams um, across you know, dozens of cities, each for about three years. Um, so the, the way this works is say you're a mayor. Pretend you're a mayor. Pretend you're um, playing Sim City, you're the mayor, um, and you want to get stuff done. You want to get stuff done that you really want to see get done. Um, problem, mayors don't have, in a lot of places, if it's a weak mayor system, a whole lot of power. So mayors end up going around kind of um, you know, being the public face of the city, um, trying to bring people together around the table to get initiatives done. Um, you know, but there's not, they can't really do a whole lot. Um, so this is a very appealing kind of way for them to get traction on um, stuff that they oftentimes don't have the money for, but they want to see it done. Um, so for example, in Los Angeles, uh, they brought in an innovation team that I did a bit of work with um, in 2015. Um, they were initially tasked with um, what they called sustainable neighborhood um, rejuvenation which was kind of like saying we want to improve the economic prospects of neighborhoods without doing gentrification. So it's very much a kind of anti-gentrification kind of thing going on. Um, it's generally something that um, a lot of people inside City Hall could get behind, but it's not something that you could really um, have a frank public discussion about a lot of the time. Um, so it may seem kind of counterintuitive that I'm bringing kind of talk into the mix here. I mean, there are these teams that are very much about sort of, um, as I'll talk about in a minute, um, data and um, sort of analytics. Um, but you know, I think my attraction to data, or I'm sorry, to talk is that um, talk is really strategically important inside of bureaucracies. Um, it's really how you build um, relationships with people. And from sort of a, you know, a, um, you know, a Goffmanian perspective, it's really about sort of um, how you perform your role and how you can get people to understand um, your identity in relation to other people. Um, and as I mentioned, I do think we need sort of a backstage um, in government. I don't think everything should be sort of radically um, um, so I, I see kind of bureaucracy less as Weber did, which is sort of composed of rationality and efficiency, 
then I do as a very large and wieldy organization composed of people whose rationalities are kind of bounded by their role, by their place in the organization. Um, and this is something that they want, that they need to manage while they're still trying to do um, kind of work that they believe in and that they can ultimately get behind. Um, so, um, so, you know, I think the other kind of key point here um, when we talk about kind of Bloomberg philanthropies, you know, I'm running a little bit late, is to talk um, about kind of where the sort of data-driven pragmatism comes from. So we have to sort of understand Michael Bloomberg in a way, because um, he's the one that kind of put together the playbook kind of that they ultimately ended up going by. Um, so he made his fortune renting Bloomberg terminals to watch the stock market. Um, so you'd pay for one of these terminals um, that would help you um, get access to um, better analytics and better insights about um, the stock market as it was um, changing moment to moment. Um, so, you know, and I think data became his brand more than any particular party. He sort of famously went through um, you know, three administrations. Uh, not just to be extended, it's because he's Michael Bloomberg. Um, and he really um, was a political moderate in, um, you know, the, just a political moderate um, such that he kind of angered people, for instance, on the left, when he cleared out Sakari Park, he angered people on the right, uh, when he, you know, imposed a uh, soda tax. Uh, so it's, it's sort of a very sort of mixed bag. But I think the one thing I always come back to is that um, there is a logic there related kind of to data. Um, so the dilemma that confronted him, much like Code for America, um, was he that if it was that he couldn't kind of get technology inside government easily. Um, so this is more of a um, organizational and um, communication problem than it was a technological problem. Um, so I think his his sort of solution was, you know, to I, I sort of thought of this the other day, is to make people computers again. So people used to be sort of computers. They used to be the ones that, primarily women, um, were kind of the first ones computing the statistics, doing that kind of work. Um, as, of course, there are whole books written on that subject alone. Eventually, that uh, occupation became more masculinized. And over time, um, you know, um, computers sort of, as we know them, um, kind of became a more privileged occupation. But I think, I think here, um, the computers are really, um, the interesting thing to me is that um, kind of the people are the ones sort of doing the sensing and doing the interpretation and doing, building these very subtle bridges, for instance, um, between parties that are feuding. This is actually what a lot of innovation teams do. They get people that are pissed off at each other to work together. It's just one of those kind of classic problems of any organization, of any sort, of any size, but particularly large ones. Um, so, you know, I, I sort of expected to when I first, you know, joined the innovation <coughs> to see a lot of this is sort of um, a logic model, and this comes out of the Bloomberg playbook. I sort of see, expected to see a lot of people adhering very rigidly to this um, kind of form when they were coming up with their initiatives. There's this whole process that I won't go into but involves sort of coming up with um, hypotheses that you then test and then sort of um, change. These get changed a lot before they get approved. Uh, but I sort of realized that the only really audience for these forms is really Bloomberg philanthropies and the collaborators inside of government. Like these aren't things that um, <coughs> are any use to anyone um, kind of outside of that world except to sort of talk about how they think this um, process is sort of logical and works. Um, but I did see a lot of sort of talking around the data. Um, and I sort of have kind of come to the conclusion that data needs talk and talk needs data. So with data, you get something kind of like authority um, to speak on a subject. Um, but <coughs> data really just functions or does very much on its own sitting in a database. You need someone to actually go and use it uh, in communication inside of government um, to cajole people to take on certain initiatives or others. Um, 
So, you know, our manager was from Deloitte. She's, so, she's sort of very fond of using talk. Um, and she would do these things that are sort of what Goffman would call shifting footing, that is, um, shifting the assumed audience of who you're speaking to. So, you know, she would frequently ask us to make the business case, referring to phrasing solutions or <coughs> tangible data points. Um, and then also seeking insights rather than statistically valid inferences. This is sort of helps me understand a little bit. When I first got there, I was like, oh, gentrification, they're really going to want a macro data sociologist, like a real number cruncher who's going to be able to look, you know, very like um, community level data to draw inferences. Um, that's not really what I saw at all. What I saw more of is people involved in the data collection um, routine and um, really as much creating the data as being informed um, by data. Um, so um, I'm running a bit long, so um, I'm just going to sort of breeze over this next part, unfortunately. Um, there's one example, uh, you know, kind of in my time there that I observed um, when they're kind of building a map for um, looking at um, neighborhood change. So they build an index of neighborhood change, um, which is this very kind of James Scott idea, right, of uh, seeing like a state. So you need a way to visualize, analyze, organize populations, particularly ones in Los Angeles with 4 million people. Um, so, you know, abductive reasoning, sort of the processes I've talked about, was designed as a way to get collaborators on board. Um, you know, and I, I think one sort of interesting part was our, our data person was actually slightly frustrated by this whole process. He sort of came on to be like, you know, I'm going to set up this index and it's going to be um, sort of, uh, you know, um, he came from uh, the business world and he just said it's going to be really kind of cut and dry. Um, you know, but he, you know, was very frustrated. At one point, he just said, you know, we get caught in loops thinking. So far from being a cleanly technocratic process, the aggregating and weighing of data based on ongoing uh, conversations meant that he was sort of torn in multiple directions. So he sort of, as someone responsible for the data, couldn't do the sort of um, pivoting um, that other people who were more attuned to sort of the, um, you know, Gothamian performance itself and the good could. Um, so, uh, sorry, I had to sort of breeze through that last bit, but I do want to leave time for questions. Um, I sort of want to kind of conclude on, um, sort of, this is the working concept I am thinking about, um, kind of, which I'm just calling uh, technical populism. So it's technical in that it's the application of administrative and technological practices to governance, the processes of governance. Um, and it's also part of kind of, I think, populism, um, which is kind of this creating of an image of a shared collective, a shared we, um, something that we can all sort of get behind. Um, and, you know, very, very much like populism itself, um, you'll notice I'm not using like democracy, I'm not like saying e-democracy or something. Um, I think there's a lot of people involved in, in trying to improve social, societal, community well-being in a variety of different um, ways. Um, however, <coughs> certainly, you know, across different organizations that I'm looking at, you know, but it's hardly value neutral. Right now, I would say it leans somewhat left in sort of a way that Michael Bloomberg, I guess, leans sort of left. Um, but there's not very much kind of anchoring it there. Um, I think it is a somewhat precarious situation where a lot of these developments are exciting, but you know, we should also be wary about um, thinking about how much we're investing of ourselves in kind of, um, supporting them. So you know, I'm, I'm both sort of somewhat excited and somewhat leery of this world of sort of um, public-private partnerships and somewhat neoliberalist ways of operating. Um, and that's sort of um, what I'm attempting to unpack. Um, you know, and, and I should also add, you know, not too many people are, um, I would say, not too many scholars I've found are super fond of this world either. Uh, you know, to political scientists and political communication professors like Daniel Price, um, 
you know, he sort of sees the world of, um, you know, Knight and Bloomberg as being a very piecemeal approach that essentially um, distracts um, people from um, cohering, uh, for instance, um, coalitions of support to gain traction on particular issues. Um, dilutes voting blocks and uh, the likelihood that people are going to um, have a robust form of activism. Um, so, you know, I think my final questions are, I don't know, like, I've talked for a while. You know, you sat there and listened, being very patient and kind. Um, so what do you think about, you know, the um, kind of organizations and forms of organizing that I've described? Um, secondarily, um, what literature do you think might be helpful? Um, I've gone back to kind of the communication canon a lot for this project. This is new to me. I don't usually um, bring in this much classic stuff. The problem about bringing in a lot of classic stuff is you have a lot of, I, I have like um, old, you know, just old dead white men just stacked like fire. And I don't know if I'm gonna, I don't know if it's gonna be that long in the winter. I'm like the actual all. men are stacked like fire? <laughs> <laughs> the actual dead men are stacked like fire? Yeah, dead men. Dead oh, men. Not I, oh, I should, yeah. Um, no, it's not safe. It's definitely a fire hazard. So, I mean, I, I think I would like this project to, you know, in a lot of what I'm talking about are about, you know, is about issues of diversity. So I really, I mean, I think this is an area that, you know, I could use, frankly, some help in kind of finding support in literature, even primary literature. Um, and then sort of a third sort of question I have, which is sort of this perennial kind of question, and I think one that in IES you're really, frankly, more attuned to than in communication, which is how do you engage with organizations involved in technology design? You know, how do you do this research? Um, you know, what are the um, boundaries that you go across? How do you sort of traverse them? Um, yeah, that's something that I've been um, kind of thinking a lot about. Um, so on that note, I'll just say, um, Thank you very much for your um, kind of listening, and I look forward to your feedback. Yes? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was really interesting. Thanks. Um, I don't have any immediate thoughts on the final questions, but I feel like I'm going to backtrack a little bit in, into the talk. Um, well, that's fine. I just I just like to put that slide up because it's better than done. Okay. <laughs> it's much better than done. Especially as thank you to um, before we've done anything. Um, yeah, a couple of questions. I mean, one is, well, if you think some about the literature, um, it was this very American, obviously US-based talk that you gave. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking that you know certainly it's a different kinds of civic engagement, especially in Scandinavia, and different kinds of traditions. I don't mind if you've drawn on those models at all and seen anything valuable in those models, some of them are transposable across. Um, the yeah. second question is, is sort of more theoretical, uh, which is about stories and what stories are and what stories do. Um, that, um, you know, I worked in the development field for a while, and there we were encouraged to produce stories because stories was what sold the analytic line that we already had. Um, on the other hand, you know, from the communication model, you had, you know, communication constitutes organization. Yeah. So you've got this idea of the constitutive nature of stories. Yeah. So I was wondering if you were seeing stories as a vehicle in the line that was already there, where you create the line for the stories. Oh, gosh. Um, I'll start with the first one. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think there are, um, you know, interesting models, um, <coughs> most obviously participants design and sort of Scandinavian Marxist model, um, which is sort of, you know, I, I know there's been sort of this debate about what's happened when it's been imported to the United States, and um, you know, as much as people sort of draw on a, a certain history of participatory design, um, yeah, sometimes it's somewhat more muted um, in really actually to your second question tends to kind of serve administrative interests. So, you know, one of the one of the tough points really is that government they need to you know do civic engagement. So but what civic engagement and how you sort of reach out to the public is 
totally ill-defined, particularly in the context of technology design. Um, so it's, it's almost like, and then also I've seen, for instance, um, you know, particular groups of users that somehow represent the public that are, you know, somewhat um, you know, friendly with the administration. Right? So, um, yeah, I'm still, and then I'm still thinking too about sort of, um, you know, more, more theories of, um, uh, you know, uh, agonism, Europe as well, and I, I, I've been trying to figure out. This is this is sort of maybe um, what I'm going to spend the next, you know, frankly, couple months sort of writing about. So I mean, that's going to hopefully be sort of the core. Um, yeah, stories. What do they do? I mean, I think it's tough because I mean, one of the things is that a lot of the you know, upper level administration, sort of young tech savvy. Um, we can just use Eric Garcetti as an example. Like he sort of stands in for a lot of these, a lot of this sort of um, these these types of sort of um, uh, mayors. Um, you know, they, they tend to be. I mean, he's sort of famously the Instagram mayor. You know, don't push. he has a really good Instagram. Um, but you know, that that's also somewhat of a problem because it really increases their, um, you know maybe increases their historical role from what it has been typically. Um, and then sort of simultaneously you do see, you know, government being asked to take things on that it historically, you know, sort of hasn't been responsible for. I mean, Bloomberg is sort of, if you wanted to go full Foucault, you could talk about reinserting Foucault inside of government. I mean, you basically have a Bloombergian administration. Um, because he's really sort of making decisions <coughs> on essentially life and death um, in things that historically weren't really the purview um, of um, government, not something they explicitly took on. All right, so I hope that at least addressed both of those both of those really good questions. Yeah, here. Yeah, yeah um, I'm, I'm going to be a little all over the place, but I, thanks for the great talk. Um, I really like. Uh, that you brought in Chris Kelty at the beginning. I felt like uh, his recursive publics, um, and I can kind of see what you're talking about with the technical populism mm -hmm. as having some sense of recursivity within it um, as a public. Can you go back a slide, though? Because I, I have a question about the technical, uh, two slides, I think. Yeah. Uh, no, no, it is this one. It is this one. So, so my question is, when is, is kind of your definition of technical or techniques um, versus data information or other terms that that technicity could be about. I guess why do you choose technical over data or over information? Because I, I, I feel like there is something to that, but I'm wondering what it is. Um, I, I can give you a very brief response. That's like my gut response. Um, I think it's more interesting to write a book talking about essentially trying to recover, you know, um, you know, the technical um, practices, which has been so crapped on, you know, justifiably, you know, by so many scholars, than it is to write another you know, book on data. I think we might, I think we might be at, and I've done a lot of writing on data, but I think for me that's not necessarily the, the part I'm most interested in, if that makes sense. Um, and I, I just think there are a lot of books, I mean, there are a lot of good books coming out on like data and algorithms. And I don't mean to dismiss them by any means, but I, you know, I, I guess I didn't want that to be sort of the cornerstone of what this was about. Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, a lot of the, I mean, some of the, you know, groups I'm looking at really aren't motivated by it. Data. Like it's not a thing that is important to them. So um, you know, and, and data too is one of those sort of objects that's you know described and sold in so many different different ways. Um, yeah. So I, I guess that's sort of sort of my my gut response. Um, it, it's it's less of sort of an analytical response than just a, where I'm coming from. 
I'm going to get back to you later with a better response. One more question. Yeah, Matt. Um, yeah, this is really interesting. I'm curious as you're thinking about the organizations. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm trying to think about the organizations of this that you talked about today. Yeah. Is that they um, are, that I, this maybe comes down to sort of a little bit more clarity about what you mean by a civic organization. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious there, you don't talk very much about hacktivists or other forms of organizations that actually are doing civic work but stand in opposition to government. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious, you know, I'm thinking, you know, you were talking about the gentrification. I know there are also hacktivist groups who are, for example, producing maps of evictions yeah. that are in opposition to government policy. And I'm curious about why that choice, or is there a difference there? Or Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I think I think sort of the fundamental difference is really one of sort of a unitary model of democracy versus an adversarial model of democracy. Like, are we all in it together, or should we have our voice heard? You know, I, I think the the ones that are part of the world I'm looking at. I keep on saying world. I, I mean I mean um, world. Um, um, you know, in, in a specific kind of way. Um, you know, big, like how we Howard Becker's sort of notion of world. Um, I I, I'm gra I gravitate to sort of the ones that are doing the sort of weird unitary stuff. Um, I think part of it is that I might have just grown up. I, I, I grew. I don't talk about this, but I, I grew up um, myself a hacker. Or what's the? Um, no, I'm just joking. I, but I did grow up in sort of hacker culture in the Boston area. Um, it's something I'm familiar with. It's something that's, I would say when you say sort of hacking and activism, that's that's what most people know, it's sort of the more activist side. I, I think this other sort of weird co-opted question mark world um, is much messier, um, probably more difficult to write about. Like this may be like on my grave someday, being like, you try to unpack this concept. <laughs> Um, but, you know, I, I think that's sort of the fundamental, um, you know, distinction is, is, is if you're trying to put, how, how you put pressure on um, government, um, how you get people to sort of change their ways. Do you persuade them or do you embarrass them? You know, um, rarely is it both of those things. Okay, it remains for uh, um, us to do our work for the afternoon and thank Andrew for a lovely talk.